everyone. It is Monday, April 12th, 2021. Happy Monday. My name is Drew Sukup. On behalf of VMUG, I'd like to welcome you to today's Expedient webcast, Today and Tomorrow Together, Expedient Enterprise Cloud Native, presented by AJ Kuftik, Principal Technologist at Expedient. Thank you for participating in today's webcast and for your continued support in the Global VMUG program. Before we begin, I have three quick housekeeping items to go over. First, today's webcast will be recorded and available for you on demand. You will receive an email with the on-demand link, so keep an eye out for that. That should be coming around 1 p.m. Central Time tomorrow. Second, a short Q&A session will follow today's presentation if we still have time. However, we do love to answer questions throughout, so all questions will need to be entered into the question and answer section on the side. Uh, even when we get to the live demo, you can still ask questions if you just move around some of these uh, widgets that are in front of you that will be available. Third, and, I, oh, and also I see that other people have already been asking us questions. So thank you to all the people who have been saying hello. Third, there'll be a short online evaluation that pops up as you exit this webcast. Please take a minute and let us know what you thought of today's session and what you might like to see going forward. All attendees from today's webcast who opted in their information at registration will be entered into a raffle to win a $100 Amazon gift card. Not too shabby, right? All attendees who have opted in will be contacted directly by Expedient. So good luck. All right, let's get started. AJ, let's turn it over to you now. Thank you, Drew. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is AJ Kuftik. I'm a principal technologist with Expedient. I want to thank you all for joining me today. We're going to talk about our cloud native platform today. Uh, for those of you who are new to Expedient, uh, we started in 2001 as a co-location provider. Today, we have 12 data centers in eight cities. Uh, in 2007, we released our virtual co-location powered by VMware uh, to provide virtual hosting. And this is very early on in the VMware game because we always want to be ahead of the technology waves for our customers. In 2015, we released our push button DR, which is the fastest failover in the industry with our transparent network failover. In 2018, we released our enterprise cloud, which is a VMware powered fully cloud, full cloud operating model and portal that allows you to manage your VMs independently and pay as you go. And last year, we released our cloud native platform. Let's talk about a lot more about that and how we can help you power your app modernization. And this is where I like to talk about the triangle of technology. Now, there's three main groups at play for building cloud native infrastructure oh, and um, these sorts of things. Sorry to interrupt, AJ. Uh, yeah. Is there a push to audience button on the bottom? Push to audience? Yeah. Are you show? Are you still on the first slide, or are you on the on the third slide? I'm on the third slide, but I'm right. turning off of my machine. Forgive me one second. Let me just. Oh, or maybe that wasn't changing for me. That might. I think that was a me problem. Here, one second. All right. If you could just take control again. I'm I mean, so sorry. Can you guys not see my screen? Uh, oh no, we I, we can. If you could just, if you could just. Um, oh, forgive me. Are you? Um, I'm sharing everything. Forgive me. You're sharing your screen, aren't you? Yes. All right. My my mistake. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Continue. Okay. It's okay. So, back to live action. We have three groups that actually have an input to cloud native applications. The first is our infrastructure group, which is probably most of you out there uh, in the infrastructure space. And I'm, I'm a very traditional infrastructure person uh, as well. And our job traditionally has been to provide security and control, right? We're the people who get asked about things in audits. How do people get access to things? Why do people have access to things? And how do we prevent them from not having access to things? And we also have controlled the infrastructure forever. We've built, all the in, we've built all the servers, configured all the networks, configured all the storage, built everything to be highly available. And so we happen to know VMs, but we don't entirely know cloud, right? Because AWS, Azure, GCP, all of them have different capabilities, different ways to do those things that may not line up with the way that we currently deploy VMs in our traditional infrastructure today. Next, we have the business. And our business people, they want agility and speed to market. 
And that's because they've watched everything change over the last year. They've watched everything change over the last five years in particular and said, we want to go faster. Our competition is beating us to the punch. Our competition is able to do things faster and we feel like we're being hamstrung by our technology. And so, listen, they go to webcasts, they go to webinars, they go to conferences, and they also hear about cloud things. They, it's not just a technology thing, it's not just an infrastructure or developer thing, it is being driven at the business level. How do I go faster? How do I meet my customers where they are? And how to leverage technologies in those specific verticals, like healthcare, manufacturing, those sorts of things. And they hear about how cloud is the way to do that. And so they say, hey, my IT teams, make cloud work because I want cloud because that makes me go faster. They don't actually know that, but that's what they want and that's what they hear. And last, we have our developers. And our developers, they, they've heard and they know that their applications are rickety, that they need some help, that they're not where they should be. It's not that their applications are bad, it's just that they were written potentially 10 years ago and don't take advantage of any modern technologies because they were written 10 years ago, right? So the problem is, is that they still have to maintain all of these applications. They have to write bug fixes. They have to write in new features that the business is asking for. So they don't ever really get a chance to modernize. And this cloud move gives them one of those big opportunities that we don't get very often in the technology space, right? We went from nothing to mainframes and mainframes to client server and client server to virtual servers and virtual servers to now cloud. These are one of the big shifts in the industry. I'm not saying anything new here, but this is why developers want to take advantage of this. And that's why they want to modernize, but they want to modernize with freedom. They know they can go to AWS or Azure or GCP, swipe a credit card and start utilizing those technologies and those platforms without the infrastructure people meddling in their business, right? It's like a Scooby-Doo cartoon. So they want to modernize and that's why they want hyperscale. And the problem is, is that all three of these groups wants, want the same thing. They want something in the middle, but they don't entirely know what yet. So let's take a look at these applications and let's break down how to actually get to where they want to go. And I wanna talk about our legacy applications and kind of how an application gets built. This is probably how your applications were built as well. It starts with base application 1.0. This is someone had an idea. We want to do a thing. Someone says, okay, let's write a new app for that. Great. They write base application 1.0. And then someone says, hey, this thing doesn't work. Or hey, can we add this little feature? Oh yeah, sure. And then we get update 1.1, 1 .1, 2, 3, and 4. All of them roll out. And then someone says, hey, I have this idea for a new tentpole feature, right? We have all this data in this app, and now I want to organize it. Oh, okay, big tentpole feature. We're going to create an entirely new reporting system. And that becomes application 2.0. And then marketing says, hey, wait, you guys have all this user data. You have a whole filtering system. Let's use that for and user communication. We wanna tell them about sales that we're having. We wanna tell them about new products that we have coming out. So let's make this our new marketing system. And this becomes application 3.0. And this is how applications grow over time to become these deep critical parts of your business that, are a t that, are, that have touch points to various business units like marketing and sales and product, right? The problem is that as these applications grow, so do their number of lines of code. And as they grow, the complexity grows even higher. And it grows that high because now you have a bunch of different groups all touching this application for various different reasons. And so the complexity of this application has gone up and I have this monstrous application that I can't do anything about. No matter how much I wanna change this, no matter how much I wanna do, my, my ability to do anything with this application is dragged to the bottom of the sea because of how big and heavy it is. So we should probably distribute the work that we have. And it's been like a year and change since I've been to a gym. So maybe it's been, I forgot how to do all this sort of stuff, but this is a 100 pound weight, right? You can buy a 100 pound barbell. It's very heavy to move. You're probably not going to lift that with one arm. Maybe you could pick it up with two hands. 
right? Maybe if you tilt it on its side, you could lift it if you tried really, really, really hard. Or maybe you could get two people to each pick it up on the side. But it's still going to require a lot of effort from you or this other person to move this around, right? But if I take that same 100 pounds, and instead of doing 100 pound dumbbell, I do five 20 pound dumbbells, I can actually distribute this work and it makes it a lot easier. I can carry two of those 20 pounders, or I can carry one and four other people can carry them. And I can distribute the amount of work that's happening here so I don't have to do as much heavy lifting. And to take it even further, I can take those five 20s, split them into 10 10 pound weights, and I'm moving the same amount of weight but I'm requiring far less effort to do that each time. So when have we actually seen this? We've seen this happen before, and it comes from a fairly unexpected place because a lot of people would consider this application to be, you know, a new fully cloud-baked application, and it's Twitter. Twitter, very early on, was a monolithic application. It was written in on-prem technology with Ruby on Rails. They used to have to deploy physical server after physical server after physical server to make this work. Because remember, this is early days of EC2. EC2 came out in 2007. So it wasn't necessarily a fully baked, everybody goes and uses a platform yet. The Twitter comes out in 2008, huge monolithic application. And they even said, we wrote it in a way that will scale forever. And then it didn't. And they would have multiple day outages. And at the time, they had 6 million users. Keep that, keep that number in your head. But if you were on Twitter in 2008, you probably saw our very good friend, the fail whale. Now, the fail whale hasn't been around in a very long time because Twitter said, we got to do something about this monolithic application. Quick side note on the fail whale, that was written for a greeting card. And then Twitter found this graphic and said, we're going to make this our 404 page. So <clears throat> this is a classic example of a company that hits a scale limit that they just can't hit, that they just can't beat. Now, why couldn't they beat that? It comes down to Moore's Law. Now, we're all familiar with Moore's Law. This is uh, Intel the CEO, uh, Roger Moore, or Richard Moore. Mm, let's go with Mr. Moore. And what he did was he came out and said, look, Processing power will grow exponentially over time, every 18 months. The problem is, is that we've kind of hit the end of it. We're not really doing that anymore. And we've kind of fudged Moore's law over time. Early on, it was every six months. Then it was 12 months. Then it was 18 months. Then it was 24 months. And it's just, it's just gotten longer. The law is still kind of sort of there, but the time scale has grown, has grown out. So in the early days, we would just throw more gigahertz at an OS. Right? We went from one gigahertz to two gigahertz to three gigahertz. And we kind of hit a point at about three gigahertz where <clears throat> without significant cooling, we can't go any further. Right? You can liquid cool and take it to like 4,500 gigahertz to 4.5 gigahertz, but you are still doing a lot more just to eke out little incremental bits of progress. So what do we do? We went to cores, right? Now, instead of having, you know, three gigahertz, one three gigahertz CPU, I have a quad core processor that has four two gigahertz CPUs. And we rewrote our applications to be multi-threaded instead of single threaded. And this allowed us to take advantage of these cores and grow past the limit of just pure gigahertz. But we run into an issue with cores too. Right? Even though AMD just released their 64 core Epic processors, we're still limited to the number of cores. You can go four sockets on a board and go full 64 core processors, but you can only have 64 or 256 cores in a single box. There's still a physical limit to the number of cores. So what did we do? We started load balancing our application. Now we have different operating systems, different instances, taking advantage of cores across multiple CPUs and across multiple servers. This gives us a number of new capabilities, but also introduces a bunch of challenges. And finally, distributed applications. Once load balancing, once we kind of figured that out, we needed to figure out a way to take it even further. The problem is, is that be, before 
cloud native technologies came along, there were a number of challenges to running distributed applications, right? You've probably seen Stephen Colbert and his four, his four palm face palm. And that's really what this comes back to. It starts with management. When you're managing a distributed application, there's way more components and way more instances that you have to manage as part of this. Where are all of they? Where do they live? How do I know that they're all up and running? How do I monitor all of those things? And then when it comes down to OS patching, instead of managing one instance, I'm managing four instances. That's four times the patching that I have to do. How do I do that in such a way where my application is up all the time? Okay, I'll do these two on Saturday, these two on Sunday, but now my patching window just got bigger. So now I have to manage all of that. <clears throat> I have to manage things like configuration management. How do I make sure that, let's say this is a web farm, that the web server files are consistent across all of them so that if a user hits web server three, that they don't get served up a different version than if they hit web server four. So how do I manage those across the board? Security hardening just scales up. So now instead, I need to make sure that all of my servers are hardened all the same way. This goes hand in hand with configuration management. How do I make sure my web files are all there? And how do I make sure that all of those are configured the same from a security standpoint as well? And then how do I scale this? How do I make sure that when I know that I can scale up to meet the needs of my customers, when do I scale back down so I'm not overspending? So there's a number of these challenges to traditional ways of doing a distributed application. And that's where cloud native technologies come in. But what is cloud native? And we talk about, most people just think that cloud native is containers and it's in a hyperscale cloud. The thing is that it's a how, not a where. There are four main pieces to this, right? It's not where you do it. You can do cloud native technologies on-prem in your existing data center today. In fact, VMware has pushed the entire Tanzu suite to do that. But it's not so much where you do it, it's how you do it. And it relies on things like modern development techniques, things like Agile, CICD, utilizing APIs instead of uh, you know, writing your things to talk directly between processes on the same box, and utilizing containers to be able to create the microservices that you need to be able to modularize your application and make it scale better and faster. It also is distributed by definition. The way that it is built and the way that it is written is meant to be distributed and it's not trying to shoehorn distribu distribution into your traditional applications. It's not like, oh, I have an app server and a web server, that's distributed, kind of, but not really. By taking that and breaking it down further and making those microservices, it creates that distribution for you. So there's three main pillars to this, and it starts with the mindset. This is where the concept of microservices comes in. Take, for example, a large retail website. That, that retail site has four parts to it. You have a catalog that has all the stuff, all your products. You have order tracking so that when I place an order, I know where my order is, if it's shipped, if I've paid, you know, wherever it is in the process. I have payment processing so that I can actually, you know, receive money for the things I'm selling. And then I have promotions. So I bought a product, but now maybe that customer might want to buy another one of my products. Or maybe I know that they bought a pair of shoes and this shoe manufacturer came out with a new pair that this person might like. I want to make sure that they know about that so they'll come buy it from me. All of those are part of a retail website and a retail organization. But if you take that large retail site, making changes to that can create its own problems. It can create problems between things like my <clears throat> customer database doesn't need to be tied into the catalog system. They could be two separate things. Right, And so by separating all of these things out, it can make it really easy. So things like my order tracking needs to be stateful, but my catalog can be stateless. My stateless part of my catalog will always change based on what filter I'm showing, based on the, the, you know, the input and output of the catalog, things that come into stock and go out of stock. Those things change state, but my order tracking needs to be stateful forever. Promotions can be stateless. Right? If the promotion system goes down and I have to rebuild it, it's not like, oh no, I've lost all my promotions. It's fine and I can resend them. But each becomes a service that can be changed independently. In 
And by separating stateless from stateful, my stateful data remains protected and available, and my stateless applications can be updated based on demand. This allows you to go into agile processes. This allows you to get into sprints that allow you to make faster updates to those applications. And that's actually a really, really big thing that is beyond just the pure technology of this. And you can do this today in your own organization. We actually went to this as part of our delivery processes. So when we have a customer sign on, that goes into an agile sprint to make sure that we are keeping up and hitting our projects on time and keeping up everything and understanding where our blockers are. So I can say, hey, we're waiting on this piece of hardware to come in. Once that piece of hardware comes in, I know that I can do that. Okay, that's a blocker on this project. And those agile processes allow you to keep up with taking care of input and outputs to your organization. Next is technologies. And we're gonna talk about containers and you're gonna see a lot more about that here in a second. But one of the capabilities of containers is to be able to eliminate dependencies. So I can have all of my dependencies inside of that container. So let's say my order tracking system uses Python 3.6, but payment processing says, ooh, there's a security fix. We need to go to Python 3.7. If I have all of that together, I have to upgrade everything to 3.7, which could break my order tracking. By putting everything into containers, I can put my dependencies inside of them and I can have payment processing upgrade their Python independently of order tracking. This also allows you to utilize best of breed languages and frameworks. So let's take, let's take for example, payment processing. PCI compliance, if I could see a show of hands, most people don't like PCI compliance because it's a big pain in the butt. But there's all of that is tied back to the fact that you're processing payments, right? It's the payment card industry's compliance regime. By utilizing maybe a third party service like Stripe or Square, I can utilize that to get my PCI compliance and eliminate that burden on my staff and all it takes is an API call. That can be really, really powerful to show a ton of value back to the business without having to actually do anything. And then you can utilize self-service elastic infrastructure. You can do this on-prem with your traditional infrastructure and it's fine, but to get the full benefits of scale out and scale in, Utilizing a self-service elastic infrastructure really allows that to happen. And finally, we have management. And this is one of the key pieces that we see early on as a struggle for organizations that move into cloud native because they're like, okay, we're going to go containerize stuff. And then it just turns into people running Docker on their laptops. And then somebody trying to run Docker on a server and there's no centralized management to it, which means that the compliance becomes really, really painful. But one of the key pieces here is that when you move to an API-centered world, you start writing between your applications in a much more consistent manner. And that consistent manner allows us to get to mobility that we never had before. It doesn't matter where it runs. It doesn't matter that these services are all sitting on the same operating system. They can run independently of one another and they're calling each other over the network. So that can run on-prem, it can run in a cloud, it can run wherever it needs to. That mobility is huge here. But this also allows for isolation, right? Just like my island here, we're in the middle, we want to isolate ourselves from other independent entities, right? So if I put my workload into a cloud, I'm going to be running my container potentially on a host with other organizations' containers. I want to be able to run those in an isolated fashion and that's what containers do. They allow you to put that sandbox in to allow that to run your application without having to worry about who else is involved. I can also drive things with policies and automate this so that my prod and dev and test can all be pushed through CI CD pipelines and not manually done by somebody on a Saturday night. This allows for faster releases, but it also allows for your developers to know that you're consistently doing things all the way from dev into prod and into the hands of your customers. And this sounds like a lot, right? And it's, it sounds like it's a, a big lift and it kind of is, but you're not late. And I think a lot of people think, oh, I missed containers and we, I missed the Kubernetes fight and serverless is all the rage now. And that may be true to some extent, but the technology adoption is nowhere near high enough for you to feel like you're late to the game or that your business is late to the game, right? 17% of organizations 
are using containers full adoption across 100% of IT. 17%. That means that 83% are not, right? It's still very early on in the game. Same thing with serverless at 15%, Kubernetes at 13%. There's a lot of growth in this sort of space that can make it so that your organization doesn't have to feel like they're being left behind. The problem though, is that there are choices to make. And I don't know how many choices you would like to have. This is the CNCF landscape. Uh, it gets made fun of on Twitter a lot. Uh, I'm gonna make fun of it here too. But in the difference here is that one of the interesting parts is that each one of these little boxes, this is all API gateways. There's uh, six, 10, 13 different API gateways as part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. There's nine or uh, 10 different service message, service meshes. And the fun part is, is that there's no one right way. You can take and add these bits and pieces together but there's no one right way to do it. And there's many, many challenging ways to do it. If you just randomly pick, if you were to just throw darts at a board to try and make all these things work together, you may have a really easy time or you may want to tear all your hair out, one or the other. But one of the other things you can think about is, do I want to do this myself versus leveraging a platform? And this is where the Amazon AKS or EKS, Azure AKS and Google GKE can come into play to provide more of a platform, but there's still challenges there. AWS doesn't necessarily keep up with the latest Kubernetes releases. Google wants to push their Kubernetes stuff everywhere. You know, how do I handle my platform? How much of this am I going to end up doing myself? And so you also have to consider stateless versus stateful. We're traditional infrastructure people. Traditional infrastructure is stateful, right? I know that this application lives in this OS, on this server, on this network, on the storage, it's in my DR plan and it's in my backups, right? And if I want to recover that application, I'm gonna to have to go to my backups or DR or leverage my high availability inside of my platform to be able to bring that back online. Cloud native infrastructure is different. It's meant to be stateless. It's meant to be able to have the application completely destroyed and spun back up. And when we were looking at building our cloud native platform, we thought, why not both? We want to be able to have stateful data storage with stateless applications. And so what we did was we took our VMware powered platform, our Expedient Enterprise Cloud, and we put our cloud native portfolio on top of it. And that's powered by Rancher, along with Elastic for logging and Portworx for container for cloud native storage. But we're able to leverage our VMware powered cloud to be able to scale this out and land your cloud native workloads directly next to your VMs on a platform with a 100% SLA. Now, this is really neat to talk about, but I'd rather show you this. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna dive into a demo here. Uh, we're gonna configure some storage. We'll configure some logging. I'll walk you through the interface and then we'll deploy a WordPress server and take a look at some logs. So let's dive into this demo here. Drew, can we see the demo here? Can everybody see that? Yep. Great. So this is our main interface. So uh, this, is our, this is the Rancher platform, and there's a lot of different capabilities here, but one of the interesting parts I think of is the nodes, right? This is the base, quote unquote, infrastructure be underneath all of your Kubernetes workloads on our platform. These demo nodes, one, two, and three, are all VMs that sit on top of our platform. When you need more, you can add more. You literally click the plus button under the three nodes to take it to four nodes, and then it re Rancher reaches into you know, our EEC platform, deploys another VM, and adds it into the cluster. So you can gain resources as you go. Those resources in the in EEC are all backed by a resource pool that provides guardrails so you don't overuse your resources and end up with a bill that you don't want, right? So if we go back to the cluster here, uh, we have a number of different capabilities to monitor this. So we have uh, our cluster metrics. So this is utilizing Grafana uh, to actually look at all of those nodes, see its CPU utilization, uh, and see all of the uh, network, disk I.O., network I.O., so on and so forth. And if I want to, I can dive into deeper dashboards inside of Grafana itself to actually see this and go deeper, even down to the container level. 
So let's go take a look at storage. Inside of cloud native storage, we have what are called storage classes. And what we do with Portworx is Portworx is connected to uh, these nodes. These nodes each have storage on them. You can think of it very much like vSAN. I'm taking the individual storage from these nodes and making it look like a centralized storage platform. But one of the things we can do here is I can utilize these replication policies, so REPL3 and REPL3 shared, to actually have different ways of writing to the storage. So REPL3 just means that when I write to one node, replicate it to the other two. So I have a consistent data storage across all of my nodes. But if I use REPL3 shared, like we'll use for WordPress, I can write to one, but I can read from any of them. So I can actually write and read from any of my nodes so that in the event that I have a node failure or something goes offline, I don't lose my website. They just keep reading off of their same local storage. Inside of logging, we can connect to Elasticsearch directly. We can even connect to Splunk if you bring your own or some syslog service if you have those as well. We've integrated to our own Elastic platform so we can monitor all of the logs. We can take care of all those things and find anomalies. And I'll show you a little bit more about that later. But all of this is connected. And so all of your logs, your container logs, but also your node logs. So you can troubleshoot problems with deployments. You can uh, troubleshoot events inside of your instances, like I'm going to go deploy a WordPress server. The admin interfaces with those on the internet happen to get hit a lot. So I can actually see all of those hits through the logs. But we're gonna to go to projects and namespaces now. And inside of Rancher, the concept of projects, and if you're familiar with Kubernetes, Kubernetes has what's called namespaces. What we can do inside of Rancher is abstract a level above namespaces. Namespaces are a group of pods, pods or Kubernetes uh, containers. So Inside of Rancher, I have projects. These are logical groupings inside of Rancher that allow me to do things like set quotas and allow permissions to all of those places. So I can do things with, um, I can grant access. So for role-based access control for all my IT admins out there, I can control that. I can also can control quotas so that if I know this is a dev cluster, you don't get 100% of the resources, you get 30% of the resources because it's dev. Right, so I can actually cordon all of that down and make sure that I don't overload my system with dev workloads. But let's go deploy some storage here. So what I have here is my MySQL volume. We're gonna deploy a two gig volume, read write once. So we're gonna use the REPL3 storage class. If I come down here, I'm gonna use the Rancher CLI to actually go do this. So Rancher kubectl apply MySQL volume YAML, and it will go out and create my, my MySQL volume and then my WordPress volume here is REPL3 shared. So I'm going to read write many, and this will be a one gig volume. So this is a shared true volume. I'm gonna come down here, do some typing. If I could type faster, I'd be really great. And so now, if I go to my volumes, I can see that I have deployed two new volumes. I have my MySQL PVC1 and WPPD claim. So these are my storage volumes that I will be using to put stateful storage behind my WordPress volume. So let's go deploy my MySQL box. So right now we're going to go deploy a WordPress MySQL instance. This is going to go use the MySQL Helm chart. So for those of you who are not familiar, Helm charts are kind of like templates inside of um, inside of the Kubernetes and container world. So I can actually pull these down. They already have the application pre-deployed and I can put in specs to actually go configure them. So we'll go ahead, we'll apply that. And now if I go to my workloads, I can see that my MySQL box has deployed. I have one pod, I have one database server and that it's up and running and happy. And now if I go to WordPress YAML, I'm gonna go deploy this WordPress box. Note that this is deploying WordPress 4.8. So just keep that in mind. This is the image that I was talking about earlier. It's going to pull this from a Helm chart. I'm gonna go deploy this and I'm deploying three replicas and I'm going to write this using the, the shared storage. So now when I go back here, WordPress is deploying three pods. So if I go open up a new browser, 
I now have the WordPress interface. And we'll just go through and say Cloud Native Blog. Type in a password, don't want to show you guys that. And we will install. So we'll log in. And now I have WordPress up and available. I am running WordPress 4.8.3, which it's fine, it works, but it's got some security vulnerabilities into it. And I can even see inside of here, the WordPress 5.4.2 is available. But enough about security, got a blog. So we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna type in some, welcome to our Cloud Native blog. Stay tuned for more Cloud Native content. And we're going to go ahead and publish because mods are asleep. So I have my post. I can click on view post here and I can see my super fancy blog. And if I go back, I can scroll down. I can see my welcome to our cloud native blog. So I can see my first post here. I can also see my hello world post. If I go back here to my dashboard though, I've got WordPress 542. I got to be really honest. Before I take this blog out to the world, we're going to go ahead and we're going to, we need to go ahead and upgrade that to 5.4. So I have my four nodes here, right? I have uh, IPs here that are all load balanced, so I can just continually hit this and there's three different sites behind it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go here and I'm going to change this 4.8 Apache to latest. And then we're going to apply this again. And if I go into Rancher, you can see that all of those nodes are being destroyed and then completely new containers are being deployed. So I have destroyed this entire WordPress site and stood up a complete new WordPress instance. If I go here and I hit refresh, I have a database update now because I'm on a new version. There's a new database schema. So we're gonna go ahead and upgrade this WordPress database. And I got kicked out because I did, because we just destroyed a complete WordPress site and redeployed it. And so now I'm back up. I'm now running WordPress 542. It's as simple as that. And I can do these upgrades. I can even do things like I'm going to change just one pod and do A-B testing that way. So there's ways to do this to gain a ton of new capabilities without having to jump through a bunch of hoops. And if I go to my posts, and I see all posts, I can see that my post is still there. And if I add a new post, I get the super cool new block editor, which is neat, I guess. We'll go ahead and put in a new title. Check out the replay of our webinar. We held our latest webinar on our cloud native portfolio. And we'll put, see the replay for that and the entire series here. Boom. And again, Mods aren't here, so we'll go ahead and publish. And if I click View Post, you can check out the replay for our webinar and see the entire instance. Now, I've logged into our admin interface a couple times here. And in doing so, I've kicked off a bunch of logs. Now, all of the logs for the container nodes themselves and the, con the containers themselves and the worker nodes running them are all pushing back into Elastic. So I can see that I have a bunch of really neat nodes here, but if I type in admin and I hit refresh, I can see all of the instances of admin, whether that's the WP admin site or anything else. And I can get even further, so I have 77 hits now. We're gonna change this to WP admin, and we'll hit refresh. And I'm now down to 65 hits. So I can actually see that I'm changing my I'm changing my search form, but I can actually find all of these things. I can even build dashboards off of this to say that we've had this many admin events this week or this day or this hour. And I can build dashboards off of that to have better visibility and observability of our platform. But here's the thing. What Twitter did in 2008 was they wrote it based on the technologies of the time. But in order to scale, they needed to make big changes. And so Twitter was actually one of the first examples of apps that containerized at scale to be able to meet new scale needs. And that's where this really comes back, right? We have a containerized app 
They went to microservices that allows them to make changes faster. You may have even seen some of their A-B testing that they do where they roll out a feature to a subset of users, not all of them. And so now the fail whale is a, you know, a mark of the past. And remember, they had 6 million users in 2008. They have, as of Q1 2019, 330 million users. They were able to scale massively. In fact, the, the line just goes almost straight up for them to actually hit the total number of users that they wanted to and to reach the scale that they needed to. And they did that by modernizing their app with cloud native technologies and cloud native processes to move faster. That's our cloud native platform. It is powered by Rancher that provides things like authentication integration. So let's say you have, you know, you don't want a bunch of developers all running their own little individual instances. You can provide a central instance, provide central authentication and full lifecycle management to your accounts. You can manage all of your containers and even connect the image repositories. With Portworx, we can do persistent storage and automate the provisioning like you saw. With Elastic, I can monitor my clusters, I can do log centralization and dashboard visualization to see what's happening in my environment. And all of this is being powered by our Expedia Enterprise Cloud with a consistent platform, proven performance, where you can put your workloads together. Because when developers and infrastructure and business come back, they say the infrastructure team says, oh, I get my platform knowledge because I know how to operate this. And I gain all of my audit controls for role-based access control and compliance. The developers get the API front end and the scalability and containers that they want. I didn't even show you guys the full front end and REST API and kubectl capabilities that are in here. There's a number of those capabilities here too. So they get all of those capabilities. So they're happy and they can modernize with the freedom that they want. And the business is now able to move faster than the market. They're able to go faster, which is what they want to do. And how do they do that? With Expedience Enterprise Cloud, our Elastic Rancher and Portworx cloud native platform. Because we see the cloud journey as a bigger thing than just our applications. We can carry on co-location, right? We started as a co-location company, that hasn't changed, right? We're doing cloud different, but we're still the same Expedient. So we can do things with physical hardware and legacy apps like mainframe, AIX, AS400. We can bring those in and directly connect those to our enterprise cloud. So you have your virtual machines, your current applications that can land and run just as they do today in your data center on a full VMware powered platform. And then as we move forward with cloud native, that sits right on top of the enterprise cloud and powers those containers and modern applications. So if you want to get your hands on this, please reach out to me, aj.cuffstick at expedient.com, or go to expedient.com slash VMware dash test dash drive and schedule a test drive of our platform. You can get 30 day, a 30 day free trial, 120 gigs of RAM, portal access to the environment, a terabyte of storage, and the Rancher platform so that you can see how to build your cloud native apps of the future. And with that, I will open it up for questions. I see we do have one in here. Um, just talked about how to get started. Um, for those of you who are looking, the, the question and answer is on the left side of the window. It may be hidden slightly. Yes, I just wanted to jump in, AJ, and let you know, anyone that wants to ask a question, please feel free to send it now. You can minimize the screen and uh, go to the question and answer section on the left panel, the left side. You should be able to see that. So send in your questions as soon as you can, uh, and we'll be waiting for that. And it looks like we briefly may have just lost AJ. That's all right. No, oh, I'm here. I'm here. There you are. Okay, just wanted to make sure. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, yes, I uh, I just brought the presentation back up. Great. Um, just wanted to drop the screen share and make it a little easier. All right, great. Yeah, that works. All right, yeah. So feel free to send in questions, questions if you have any. Uh, meanwhile, AJ, this has been a great presentation. I, I loved the demo. Uh, I, I went in the audience side to watch it, and I've been having a great time. Great. Yeah, I mean, this is this is something where I think this is a, a we see this at, at Expedient as a big challenge for organizations because this is, it's hard to know where to start. Um, we have spent a lot of time building this platform. In fact, one of our largest customers is utilizing this platform um, because we recognize that this is where applications are heading. Um, but we also recognize that not everything is going to go immediately. Not everything is going to go ever. 
right? You're going to have those legacy applications and even your current applications, things like that are commodity off the shelf software, where you don't necessarily have that full control to do the things uh, to like rewrite the code and containerize it like you would like you may want to. This is a way for you to do that. Uh, I think it's very uh, interesting from a an overall you know industry standpoint that this is where a lot of people want to go, but they don't exactly know how to get there. Um, so we wanted to build a platform that allowed to do that. Can we use these services in an on-premises infrastructure? Uh, we offer our platform, our on-site private cloud, uh, and yes, we can. So we can connect this to our on-site private cloud. We can even manage um, on-site Kubernetes infrastructure as well. So you can utilize this as a management plane that is operated for you and then take it from there. Uh, in fact, the um, we can use the our Rancher platform. So if you have developers that utilize the Amazon, Azure, GKE platforms, uh, you can use those with Rancher to be able to do that. Uh, so there's a, a number of different capabilities. It's not just inside of our four walls. You can do you can do it on our platform. You can do it on your platform. Uh, we can meet you where you are. And that was actually one of the big reasons we we partnered with Rancher on this because we wanted to get a bigger uh, a bigger platform to utilize so that we're not just inside of our four walls. Yes, we see this as a we see this as a huge challenge because people don't even know where to start. And even then, it's still a lot of infrastructure that you're maintaining um, without being able to do anything with it, right? You need to go build all this infrastructure just to get to the point where your developers can start writing things. We wanted to accelerate that process and make it a lot easier and make it fully managed. So we, by, by the way, this is actually something uh, that I didn't cover in the presentation. Uh, when we do upgrades, we actually do pre-flight checks of the um, infrastructure, or not of the infrastructure, of the applications to make sure that they will work with the next version of Kubernetes. So when we do our upgrades, we are doing pre-flight checks for you as part of the managed service. Uh, are there hardware dependencies? No. Um, we can do it on our platform. Uh, it makes it a lot easier because then it's still a fully managed platform in your inside your data center. Um, but we can also do um, manage, this is just connecting to VMware. So we can do it that way as well. We got a thank you from from one of our listeners. Thanks, Renato. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. It's always nice to get a thank you, right? <laughs> we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for the thank you. I mean, this is another thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this, is where, this is what we see as a huge challenge for the industry and we want to help. Um, we also have a number of other uh, multi-cloud capabilities that we just released this past month. Um, it's, we see a multi-cloud world being the way forward. Uh, and all of our technologies that we have today in our data, in our data centers and that we provide as a managed service are being uh, deployed as multi-cloud. We want to be able to support those workloads wherever they may be because we recognize that not every cloud is the right fit for the right workload. And this is a way for us to do that going forward. So um, this is just one piece of it. Uh, we also offer uh, multi-cloud management, cost optimization, um, file services. So you go to our website, expedient.com slash services slash multi-cloud. Multi you can also uh, just go to expedient.com and click on the services bit at the top, uh, and you can click on the individual services. We just released a number of security features as well, multi-cloud firewall, um, micro-segmentation, a lot of different things coming. Um, it's, a, it's a big year for us. We're very, very excited. And I think this is, this is actually like the, this is the like, uh, like hidden intro to it with all the container management that we're doing. Yeah, anyone that's following Expedient knows it's been a big year. So uh, it's always exciting to hear what uh, you always have in store with us. And AJ, I think this has been the third or maybe even fourth webcast we've done together. And every time it's just, you know, it's just great. Every single time. Yeah. We've got a lot of fun up our sleeves um, working on some big, big things. So hopefully I'll, I'll come back in the probably in the fall, maybe, to talk about them. So 
Keep an eye out for Expedient. Always keep an eye out for Expedient. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, and with that, I think we've exhausted all the questions and we've got a lot of thank yous. So uh, you're welcome to everybody and thank you for joining us. Um, AJ, is there any last thing that you would like to uh, push out for our audience? Uh, go to our, uh, you can also go to our website uh, and sign up for a free cloud assessment. Uh, you can go to Expedient.com, uh, click on services and click uh, assessments uh, where we can walk you through an assessment of your infrastructure and what what the right clouds would be for those workloads, uh, helping you land those into an enterprise cloud, your stay on prem, or even move to a hyperscale cloud. We can help that all the way through. So please check that out as well. All right, great. And we got another thank you from uh, Cliff saying, thanks, AJ, great presentation. And I couldn't agree with Cliff more. Thank you, AJ, for taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, as a reminder to our audience, you will receive a follow-up email with the on-demand link from today's webcast. Again, expect that at around 1 p.m. Central Time tomorrow. It'll be in your email. Uh, to find out more about the VMUG webcast program, visit vmug.com slash webcast, and you can watch all of our on-demand uh, webcasts from the last six months, and you can hear my happy voice in every single one of them. <laughs> uh, please make sure to complete the short online evaluation that will pop up as you exit this webcast, and let us know how today's session went. And from all of us here at VMUG, thank you and have a great rest of your day.